Hi everyone and welcome to our lecture number six in our course F110 Autonomous Racing. My name is Johannes Beetz and today I will give you an introduction to our first path planner. We call it the reactive methods for planning. Just remember a little bit, you got now an overall introduction to the vehicle, to the foundations of ROS, to BID controller, and so on. And you learned how to drive in the simulator, as well as you drove the first time with your F110 car. And now it's time to enhance your knowledge. We will now develop a first algorithm that gets is first intelligence and is able to react, reacting to objects that are on its way and we will achieve after this lecture that we can implement something where we can actually drive with the car, drive more intelligent with the car and we are able to race with these algorithms. So today I will give you a First of all, an overview. How does the reactive methods look like? We will have then in a second part, a step-by-step in-depth analysis. How do we approach this algorithm? Third of all, we will have a very good video introduction from UNC, another university, which, uh, where they use that algorithm. We will then now um, get to know two more, uh, three more algorithms, a bug algorithm, a Tangenian algorithm, and the artificial potential fields. And all of them will give you an idea how you can implement reactive methods for planning for autonomous vehicles. Yeah, that's an overview. Now let's get ready and we start with the first introduction. This video shows you our F110 simulator. And you can see here that we implemented the reactive methods for planning algorithm. You see here, the car is driving. The car is stucking to the middle line, but as soon as it sees an obstacle, it avoids the obstacle and is driving around the obstacle. No matter how many obstacles are there, like here in this section, we can see um, a sinus wave um, movement of the vehicle, or if you put another vehicle right in front of it. This is just a simulator. Let's get now to the real hardware. You will see an example here. The car is driving. As I told you, it's stucking to the middle line, or it's trying to stuck to the middle line, but it's avoiding. It's avoiding obstacles, as you can see here, and it's avoiding driving into the wall, and it's actually following a path. What you also can see here that the car is really nervous because it's always figuring out the next possible waypoint where it's driving to and where it's planning its path to. And now it's a question, how should we get to that level of performance and without a map? So this algorithm does not need any map. It's not relying on any specific a priori knowledge here. It's basically getting us all this information. It's just seeing right in this moment where it's driving. And in this lecture, we will teach you how to pursue that level of performance. And the first algorithm I will introduce to you now is called follow the gap. Follow the gap is pretty simple. What you can see here in the middle is our F110 vehicle here. And you learned in lecture two about the laser point, uh, the LiDAR data. The LiDAR is sending out its laser beams and is getting the point cloud back. We have here a two dimensional area. And you see here we have like about 10 points and you receive the information from the distance. You see here it's 0 0.5, you see here 6.0, we would now say it's meters, let's say six meters away. 
And now there's the question, where should the car drive? And I will give you a few seconds to think about that. What do you think? What is the best direction where the car can drive to? First of all, it should be, it should be the inf position. But why? Why is inf a good position for us? Inf would display a really uh, a distance which is really far away. It's the furthest distance we can imagine here. And first of all, we would say, yeah, let's drive in this direction. But why might this be wrong? Like following just the inf here might be wrong because of the three on the left and the three on the right. This means we have a really close obstacle right in front of us, about three meters. And in the middle of that is the inf value. So here it might be that the inf value is just like a small gap for us. And the three on the left and the three on the right is right next to it. If we approach the inf, we might crash into the three on the right side or the three on the left side. So the inf displays us um, that there is a gap far away. It's the furthest point we can imagine. But it might be wrong just to pursue that inf value here because of the other values around. So we need something more intelligent here. Let's figure something else out. Let's say we just not want to follow one gap. Let's say we will follow a series of, of, of at least n consecutive hits that pass some distance threshold t. What does it mean? We will take here now two numbers, n, is called number three and t is number five. This means for us n consecutive hits means we need at least n values we will calculate. What you can see here is that we searched for a threshold for with a value of five and this threshold with a value of five displays us that we at least need a higher um, distance number than five. And the first gap might be here. It might be here that we choose between the five, six, seven, or six, seven inf. In this gap here, we have our first consecutive n bigger than three, where we have at least n uh, t bigger than five. We have 5.1, we have six, we have seven, and we have inf. Another gap, might be that we have here the inf, the eight, and the five. This has also n consecutive um, hits, one, two, three here, and each of the hits is bigger than five. We have inf, we have eight, and we have at least five. This means for us, we have two gaps in this field, and we can follow both of these gaps. So how do we decide to go in the right direction? We choose at least the bigger one. We go for gap number one because gap number one is not only three, it's also four. It's five, six, seven, and inf. So four hits we have, and which means this must be the biggest gap for us. So we will follow this gap. And now you learned how to drive with your car in a very reactive manner because you're always searching for the biggest gap. And which is good for us because we can drive with that. But there's one important point here. The question is, why does this naive follow the gap approach does not work for us? You see here again, this is our vehicle and the orange points you can see here is the LiDAR detection. So each of the orange points here means now we have one LiDAR beam that is um, reflected by a surface of an obstacle. We see here now that a LiDAR can go through the gap here and has its limit arrive, uh, has its limit here. 
these LiDAR detection, we have also our threshold or let's say our area where the car is um, yeah, searching for the gaps. And we will see now here that the gap um, or let's say the first gap we want to approach is between the first obstacles. And this gap is broad enough for us, definitely. But the gap for us would be here right in the middle because like of the threshold of the vehicle. And we would, if we approach that point in particular, we would crash here right into the obstacle. So this means like following the naive follow the gap method here would not lead to a sufficient vehicle maneuver because the car itself it's just approaching the next point so it's driving directly um, to this point and with this point it would crash here because it's not reacting to the wall on the left side so again the idea of seeking out the largest gap is, is, is very good, is very good idea at all. And it works very good for the holonomic robots like the turtle bot you learned from Res. And it works fine for non-holonomic robots in environments with sparse opticals. Here's a little short um, reminder for you from the robotics. If a robot has many or more active degrees of freedom as effective, one speaks from a holonomic system like the turtle board. The turtle board, for example, can turn around itself and then approach to the left or to the right. For example, you take the movement of the robots. This meant that the robot can move in the workspace both in Y and X direction without thereby changing its orientation. Like the turtle bot can move to the left, can move to the right and not needs to turn around. A non-holonomic system, like a car is a non-holonomic system, on the other hand, can not do this because of the number of effective degrees of freedom is greater than the active degrees of freedom. This is very important. The robot with, with the differential drive can thus do not change from one configuration to another. If it wants to drive, let's say if the car wants drive to the left side, it must turn to the left before it can move in this direction. So our steering has to turn to the left again. This is just a short reminder for you in the comparison between holonomic and non-holonomic robots. So it is good, it works for both of them, but it doesn't optimize the safety, which means our gap here does not optimize that we not crash against the others because it's pursuing that. It does not consider the car's dimension. Again, we do not know how the width or the length of the car is, so we would crash here. And it's hard to decide our threshold T. So what is the number of distance we want to approach? How do we choose that? Because if we have like smaller gaps, bigger gaps, we cannot change that dynamically. We have to decide that before. And therefore we are searching for a better idea. And one better idea was this plate um, at the F110 Grand Prix at Montreal from the UNC. And we integrated a video for you where you can see here the detailed approach um, from UNC. And I would recommend you to watch this video in detail so you get an idea how it worked there. In this lecture, um, we will now um, enhance this follow the gap a little bit and call it the F110 follow the gap. And the idea is that in every time step, we clearly avoid the nearest obstacle. And this is like something a little bit different now from the approach before. An approach before, we are we are looking for the furthest LiDAR point we can drive to. 
Now we are looking for the closest LIDAR point we could actually hit. So we are now a little bit more pessimistic here, but this approach enhances our idea from before and it's driving or setting our car drive faster and better. And we will now go more a little bit into detail about how we can approach this. First of all, we have the same um, um, map as before. We have the three obstacles. We have our car here. We have, again, the LiDAR points, the, the individual wireless beams that get reflected here. And first of all, we try to find the nearest LiDAR point and put a safety bubble around it of radius B. So now it's your turn. What do you think is the nearest LiDAR point for us here? In this case, we were choosing one of the two LiDAR beams here because it displays us um, here the nearest obstacle and we're searching for the nearest obstacle. So we now take this LiDAR point here, we choose this one, and we put a safety bubble around it with a specific radius RB. You can see it now here. And what you also can see that this LiDAR point was chosen because of the real LiDAR data. We get now here the distance, the distance from each of the beams and 3.1 is the closest LiDAR point for us. What do you do now in step number two when you get this information? We set all the points inside the bubble, which means our bubble is um, detecting not only this point specifically, it's detecting the point to the left and the point to the right too. And we set it to the distance zero. And we say all non-zero points are considered now as a free space. So this means we set it now to zero. We see it here. We come from the three and we set it to zero and we set the left and the right points to zero two. And now we say this is because of all the points from the threshold here. And we say now this must be an obstacle, which means like here's obstacle and here's the obstacle. Our thresh threshold was not, um, was not depicted too big because otherwise we would then here have a gap. It is a, a, not a gap, but it is actually a gap. But because we searched it a little bit smaller RB, we would not detect this area here now as an obstacle, but we come to this point. But now we would say like here, you can drive in this area, which means this space here. And this is now the safe space for us where we can drive to. But in number three, we will search now for the maximum length sequence of consecutive non-zeros among the free space points, which mean we are searching for the max gap. And in this, this um, specific discussion, it's this area here, displayed in these points above. Similar to the follow the gap, we are searching for consecutive points with the maximum gap. Again, uh, we can choose this threshold here too, but now it's just the complete area. And we will search then for the best point among this maximum length of sequence. Because now we do not know which is the waypoint we want to approach, which is the waypoint we want to follow. We have to find this too. So first of all, what we can do is we are chasing, chasing, um, searching for um, the furthest point in the free space and set it to our steering angle towards. This is very naive. But again, what is the, the um, point? This is the most farthest away, it's furthest away. It might be this here. And this is not good for us because we might slow down the vehicle we go in a 
completely wrong direction because if we are approaching this point here, we have to turn around here again. If we are come too close to this point here, we have to move around here again. So this is just a naive approach. It works, but it's not the best one. So here in this case, yeah, this could be the first, first point and we can approach this point. Um, but again, we will um, lose velocity here. And we do not want to lose velocity because we want to race with this approach. So a uh, better idea and intuition is if you are in like three or four meters away from your closest obstacles, should you immediately make a sharp turn to avoid it? And yeah, this is a really good question. Can you do that? Should you do that? Probably. But here it's more or less up to you to decide what is the best idea to approach this furthest point. Or if you say like, I go to a little bit more close point um, to not make so sharp turns. Yeah, to sum it up, um, again, in this field, what we have learned here is our follow the gap approach, um, but a little bit more advanced and a little bit more enhanced. And again, first of all, we find the nearest light up point and put a safety bubble around it of the radius R. We set all points inside a bubble to distance zero. All non-zero points are considered as free space. Step number three, we will find the maximum length sequence of consecutive non-zeros among the free space points, the so-called max gap. And then we are searching for the furthest point in a free space and set our steering angle to it. We have seen now that this approach is more pessimistic than the previous algorithm. Unlike that, we, what we are doing here is, yeah, it's different. On one hand, before we searched for the furthest point, now we are searching for the closest point and try to avoid it. The safety bubble you see here is having a specific radius. So we are encoding here the car's dimensions. So a very good value for us would be the width of the car, which means our car, if it's coming closer to that, is always avoiding this point here because it cannot approach. And if we turn here, the width of the car would, because of the width of the car we choose here, we would not hit the wall. Then we are avoiding the coast obstacle by a fixed mar margin. What we can also do, the dynamic change of the bubble. The closer we get to an obstacle, so think now that the car is driving here, the more lighter points get you into the bubble and the better I can choose where to bring my bubble to. So the switching of the bubble just occurs by approaching the bubble further and further. This algorithm is faster for the car and is more safe than just approaching the single gap we learned before. And this is our idea of your first approach for driving with a vehicle. And we um, saw this algorithm in Grand Prix in 2007. And now it's time for your first race. You can see here the car is driving now. And it's time for race number one. And it's a time attack with the single car. You get penalties for crashing and you have to complete five laps without crashing. And follow the gap or the reactive methods would be your first algorithm to drive there safely. But now, follow the gap um, is not the only algorithm you can choose of. There are many other reactive methods and today we want to show you a little bit more of them. First of all, it's a so-called bug algorithm. And this is from 1996, which is like almost, yeah, 25 years old. But 
And um, even if the algorithm is very old, it displays us a simple and fast approach to avoid obstacles. I show you here a video. You see the robot here, and the robot is approaching one goal above here. And it's always knowing, knowing where the goal is, and it's always trying to approach this goal. I will replay the video again. You can see here the algorithm is driving against an object, is not driving against this object, but it's sticking to close distance, having a threshold distance, and is again approaching his goal again. So to give you an overview, again, we have no global model of the world. For example, like all the obstacles are unknown on prior, which is really good for us and interesting for us because we can react to dynamical changing objects. We don't know, we don't need to know anything prior um, before driving with the car because we can set up our algorithm. The only thing we need to know is that we can detect our local environment. So we have like local knowledge about the environment with sensors and we know the global goal. We can specify it by the heading or the distance so we can always calculate it, but we need to know where it is. The original bug algorithm variations, bug zero and bug one, they dealt with like planning based on tactile sensing, which means they got the information from bump sensors or from ultrasonic sensors, which means they are really close to the wall. And these results were published around 1986. So we are not using bump sensors here in our car and it would not work with our car because it always has to crash against the wall. Then it's heading back a little bit again. But what we can do, we can use an algorithm which is called Tangenbug and a variation that uses measurements from the LiDAR system. And what the tangent bug is, I will show you now. First of all, we have a distance, a distance P, which is the closest distance to an obstacle along our LiDAR ray, emanating from point X at an angle theta. Both X and theta are displayed in our, in our um, specific number ranges. And we have a saturated distance function for some range R, which is displayed um, above. So what does this math mean for us here? We have our robot here in the middle. The robot is using his range sensor measurements to compute the endpoints of a segment. Let's choose this segment here above. We will focus on this. We have beam number one, B1 here, and we have beam number two. And between these beams, we have a continuous segment for an obstacle boundaries. This blue line between B1 and B2. And we are using now this calculation to set up this continuous space. The algorithm currently thinks it has an unobstructed way to his goal. So he does not know that this goal is behind here. Let the algorithm or our um, robot drive a little bit further. We will now drive to the next point we will figure out that here is now beam number seven and beam number eight. And we have, again, our continuous segment on an obstacle boundary. The algorithm now sees that it can't go straight to the goal. What, what can it do now? We can integrate here a, a, a heuristic we define by ourselves. It's the distance from the point of our obstacle to a specific boundary i. And from we put that in addition to the distance from this specific boundary i to the goal. For example, we have our boundary from x to 8, and then we can calculate the distance from b8 to the goal. And we're trying to minimize this 
this heuristic and then we know which way to approach. If the distance starts increasing, the algorithm start following some boundary. So it can just like follow this boundary again. And automatically it appears to follow the boundary. What we can see here, we approach now our obstacle here. We will see that it is an obstacle here and our robot is turning to the right side and it's following this object around the boundary. And therefore, with this tangent bug algorithm, we can also pursue our reactive methods. What are the disadvantages of this approach? It seems very promises, but promising, but all algorithms have disadvantages. First of all, prone to talking long trajectories towards the goal. Occasionally gets too close. Second of all, the heuristics we choose, the addition of the distance from the robot to the beam and the beam to the goal, it requires knowledge about distance to the goal, which isn't necessarily easy to get, which means we don't know probably where the goal is, for example. Um, it requires like the beacon setup means we need to figure out um, where the goal is particularly and calculate the distance to the goal. Because we need a measurement where we say, this is the distance to the goal. If you don't have that, it's getting difficult. Even if we let the goal be some local point in our LIDAR scan, we still need another heuristic to figure out which goal point this should be. Again, we need an information about the goal. And this is um, difficult to implement. If you want to get a little bit to know more about the debug algorithm, we can um, recommend you the additional reading, number one and number two here. And it might help you to tune your algorithm if you want to choose the tangent back or get a little bit more detailed knowledge about this. The third algorithm, um, sorry, the fourth algorithm we will show you today are the artificial potential fields. And we will show you now an additional simulation about a robot. This robot here is approaching different obstacles on the left side. And um, this robot is trying to find its path through these obstacles. A goal is um, given here, I think it's behind there but it's not displayed and we see this algorithm is going very straight and strict through these obstacles its path is yeah some kind of how clear um and it's following the right way around here and it's going through this um these obstacles here so how did we manage to set up such an algorithms. The artificial potential fields have a basic idea. You can think of an electric or magnetic field, like over the environment. Just say you have your car, you have an obstacle, and so you say it's magnetic, which means it's either positive or negative. We displayed this here for you. We have our robot, this is here above, it's Q start and we are driving from Q start to Q goal here. And Q goal is always negative and our Q start, our vehicle is always positive, which means the positive is attracted to the negative and is trying to approach that, but it's avoiding positive obstacles because they are the same charge, which means attach positive charges to the obstacle and the boundaries. And this is, gives our potential field and a mathematical expression where we can say u q equals u at q and u rep q. And with this algorithm, we can try to approach our goal because we are always avoiding the plus and always trying to approach the negative two. Another potential field we can set up with 
a gradient descent. You can see here now on the left, we have highs and lows like mountains. And we have here in 3D, this potential function gives us like landscape. And from a reactive standpoint, we will have to create a new landscape for every timestamp using the local LiDAR scan. And we are driving towards the goal. We are our gradient descent, which means we are trying to figure out the fastest and the direct way down to our goal point. We set up you the pseudo algorithm here um, to give you a little bit more information about that. Um, of course, the disadvantages first. With um, on the gradient descent, we are always trying to approach local minima. So we have several variations of the original algorithm that have been proposed to reduce the problem. Some of these require a global map. So um, remember that we didn't use a global map for other vehicles, uh, for, for other algorithms. Here we need it now. In reactive implementations, we have repeatedly do the gradient descent at each time step, which means we always have to um, do the algorithm, do the calculation again, which is time consuming. For small local scans, it can, we can use the so-called brush fire algorithm. And once again, how do we choose the goal point? We don't know where it is. We don't know how to select that because like we have for example, not the global map for us. And therefore, we can also recommend an additional reading. Um, first of all, a NIEEE paper and from uh, the Carnegie Mellon University, a motion planning capture where the um, artificial potential field is um, displayed in more depth. So what are the takeaway on the algor alternate algorithms we just displayed you. Most of them require some notion of the global goal, which we actually don't have. In the racing, we might choose, of course, the start and finish line. But if we do not have our global map for the racetrack, this is getting difficult. Um, the F1 talent algorithm implicitly encodes the global goal, um, which may be a good or a bad thing. So remember, we have in our follow the gap approach implicitly said we have to follow our racetrack. We have to come to the end again where we have to start and finish line. So this is good because we don't need actually implement this, but this is also a bad thing. So what we can re recommend you, you now received all the knowledge from us where we displayed you a very good method, method for a reactive behavior of the vehicle. This means you can now drive with the car. You just can now focus on one velocity only. You now know how to handle walls, how to handle objects, even objects that just appear in front of you. You can handle them. But we recommend you try your own for the race. Number one, you will have the base code outlining to your algorithm, but you can enhance it. Perhaps you can think of more and better heuristics, of more metrics we can integrate to make these algorithms more smooth and more advanced. Thank you very much for listening today. I hope you enjoyed lecture number six. This was your first introduction to a path planner that is getting reactive um, afterwards and can be used for the dynamic path planning of your vehicle. Enjoy race number one. If you have questions, reach out to me. Thank you very much. Goodbye.